Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and I'm excited to say that we're starting a brand new campaign on the channel today, and we are going to jump back to the 182 start for the Mandate of Heaven chapter pack, and we'll be playing as Lu Zhi. So here we are uh, on patch 1.7.1, 1. uh, the beta version. It hasn't gone officially live yet, but we have opted into the beta after finishing up our other campaigns. So we'll see uh, actual map change. Um, it will be slightly different here, around where Hulao Gate is placed, uh, near the capital. You see Songshan has been moved from over here to over here, and there's a giant mountain range that now protects Luoyang from the south. Actually, uh, aside from that change, the rivers also saw some updates, and we'll take a look at all that and make some comments about that while we start off this campaign. As for our own campaign, our starting location uh, is very difficult. Uh, the very hard starting situation is pretty accurate. I think for at least beginners, this campaign is really not the easiest one to get started on. And the reason is, the three brothers of the Yellow Turban Rebellion starts right to our north, and we start at war with them from turn one. And the land that we have is very poor. We have Hlenei, the capital, and the farmland. And to make matters worse, most of the map is already settled, and everyone is in the empire you know, the high empire, it's still strong in 182. And because we're all in an empire, I can't really expand into any of their land, nor do I have the time to do that. I have to just fight the rebels off. So our economy is never going to pick off from the ground. The only good news is that we have access to some trade routes, which cannot be said to the same for other factions after the map change because they added a lot of impassable shallows uh, on the river making it, you know, not available for troop to move through, but also not available for trade routes to move through. So because our port from the harbor, or it's not a port, it's technically a harbor in our capital, is uh, east of the last shallow, we have access to, you know, all the riverways here, all the coastal cities here, everything up to Kui Pass right here, which they add another shallow. So we actually have, also, if we go down south, we go down the Pearl River, so actually we have a lot of possible targets to trade with. That will supplement our income. But aside from that, we're going to be very poor. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of battles. That part's going to be difficult. And as a faction mechanic, the only thing we have is the Great Library. And this is a collection of books uh, from across the Empire. We can place them on display, up to five books for special effects or bonuses that are granted from the books. And this is really the main feature of this campaign that I wanted to do. Uh, because I wanted to collect these books, I wanted to share the lore and history behind these books and what they mean. So each episode will be diving pretty deep into one of these books. Um, the order is going to be kind of weird. Um, it might be based on when we unlock them, but sometimes it might be just based on like historical connections between books. Like we just talked about a book last episode, we're going to talk about a different book that's related to it the next episode, even if we don't unlock it or it's very difficult to unlock because some of these requirements is actually quite difficult to do uh, on this campaign because some of the time it asks you to uh, hire five enemy generals, for example. And if we're fighting yellow turbans, most of the time we're not going to be able to hire them because different subcultures, you can't hire yellow turbans as a Han faction. So that stuff is out of the way. We have to maybe play beyond uh, the Mandate War to get that to finish. Maybe we'll be going out to uh, the Laon Rebellion. So that's part of the main focus of this campaign, sharing a lot of stories about these books. Uh, we do have some special units going for us as this faction. We have two unique units, the Defenders of the Empire, which is a spear infantry that's available once your general reach level 3. And this is an excellent frontline unit, probably one of the best frontline units in the game. It is a little bit pricey, so best uh, is in quotation marks, because sometimes if you can't afford them, it's not any good. But overall, the reason why they're good is they're basically advanced versions of the spear guard, but they're unbreakable which is exactly what you want out of a front line. You want them to hold so your range units, your cavalry have time to deal their damage. And speaking of cavalry, we also have an upgraded or unique cavalry unit, shock cavalry unit, that's available once your characters reach rank 6. Now that's going to be a pretty constraining factor because uh, reaching rank 6 takes some time. And if we're talking about mandate war, you don't actually have that much time uh, before the action gets started. Uh, so it's a good thing you do start out with a few of these. Uh, you can decide if you want to keep them or not. Their main thing is that they have splash attack, which means their regular attack distance when they hit something will deal damage 
in sort of a wave around that unit to other units. So it's stronger for sure, uh, but it's not necessarily what you're looking for in a shock cavalry, in my opinion, because you could get cheaper versions of you know regular militia shock cavalry, uh, end up with a pretty decent charge and just nail people from the rear while your front line, the unbreakable front lines engage and can do decent damage. You don't have to keep your cavalry involved in sustained fights. So the splash damage really never becomes a thing. And the biggest weakness for this unit in particular is that they're really slow. I think they have probably one of the slowest speed. Maybe not the slowest. I, I think some of the really heavy cavalry units do have slightly slower speed than them, but they're definitely consider a very heavy unit, uh, which is good for mass. You can charge through units much better and uh, knock down. That's great. But I still um, kind of 50-50 on these units. Not as you know strong as these, in my opinion. I feel like Defenders of the Empire is definitely uh, the go-to unit for this campaign, especially fighting against masses of uh, yellow turban units, which sometimes are unbreakable themselves. They have quite a few high morale unbreakable units on their roster as well that we have to deal with. Aside from that, we have one unique assignment uh, that only strategists can do, I believe, which is actually kind of strange, because usually when you have a unique assignment, it's available to all classes, but I think Luger's unique uh, assignment, the teaching assignment, is only available on strategists. It's a 100% boost to all character experience in local commandery, and then a 50% experience boost to all characters in adjacent commanderies. It's actually quite a lot. Uh, it does help you level up your generals faster to gain access to these unique units, so that's great. And because uh, our money is tight, we're probably going to have to have a very small roster of very um, powerful generals, I guess, high level generals. And usually you're afraid of the satisfaction uh, hits due to leveling up too fast, desire for higher office. But we actually have quite a few good traits on most of our starting generals to uh, counteract that, which we'll see quite uh, soon. And we have uh, our loyalty to the Han, we are our governor faction. Um, this is really not going to kick in. I don't think the plan for this campaign is to beat the Mandate War and then wait till the Empire dissolves and then become a Three Kingdoms, or wait till three other factions become Three Kingdoms and then take their Emperor seat. That's not the trajectory of this campaign. We're going to talk about the books, we're going to beat the Mandate War, and then find a good stopping point to the campaign, because that's really the goal of Mandate of Heaven uh, campaigns. Just the Mandate War is the main objective, and you get a victory screen all the same after that. And plus, Ludra is not one of those factions that's really involved in the Three Kingdom period, just because we are a kind of old, uh, and um, we die quite early on in the period. We die officially, historically, in 192. So we don't make it much longer than Rise of the Warlord. We do start with one other unique character, and that's Huang Fu Song who is another excellent general during this period. We'll talk about their relationship and their history once we jump into game. And as for our leader himself, we do have some nice bonuses. Uh, our traits are interesting for a strategist. We have sincere, scholarly, and trusting, uh, none of which is a blue trait, uh, but we still have decent amount of cunning. Uh, not super high, but a decent amount. Uh, and these definitely help us with combat stats, a little bit of extra expertise, resolve, and authority because we're a leader. Our background bonus um, will give us, or the respected mentor, uh, will give us 10% character experience, plus two starting rank for all recruits, and plus six morale. And these are nice. Uh, these are nice bonuses that we have. So obviously these bonuses are part of what's called respected mentor. That's because we are well-known teacher during this period. We are kind of a scholar general, uh, which is a very common combination during this period. Um, scholars were not just, you know, in the library reading books, they were leading men on the field as well because being part of the government uh, require you to be educated, require you to be a Confucian scholar during this period. So it's very common for many of these uh, generals to had a Confucius education growing up and Lu Zhi is one of them. And he had great teachers and some very um, powerful classmates among himself. And he later on become a teacher himself and some of his more famous students obviously would be Liu Bei and Gong Sun Zan, who are both uh, eventually going to be playable. So Liu Bei and Gong Sun Zan uh, studied under uh, Lu Zhi, whose hometown is from the northeast. And uh, his branch of the family went on and did great things. Um, 
they didn't all die from the conflict. He died of old age, so it's not like he got murdered. And I think his sons and grandsons all worked、uh, in the government,、um, in the kingdom of Wei and the kingdom of Jin, a dynasty of Jin, I guess technically. And、um, even future generations, I think, up to the Tang Dynasty, they were involved in government. And there was,、um, you know,、uh, the rebellious period during the mid Tang Dynasty in the north, and that caused. Groups of his family to flee into modern-day Korea, and actually, I believe the sixth president of the Republic of Korea、um, actually is from his clan,、uh, and he visited China, visited his grave. Actually,、um, it's from the same branch, not like a direct, you know, connection, but from that branch of the family who fled、uh, during the Tang Dynasty into what's modern-day Korea.、Uh, anyways, that's all.、Uh, Side trivia.、Uh, we'll jump into game. We'll be playing this on legendary, legendary 40 minute battle timer.、Uh, no mods because we're on the beta patch, and we'll just be kicking things off. And China must be united once again. Zhang氏兄弟揭竿而起，意在诛灭吴道昏君，推翻汉王朝。雄心也望如燎原之火，一心难灭，终至欲壑难填。试问天下有谁能抵挡权柄的诱惑呢？宦官们对汉室倾
Um, I mean, okay, I, I think I know what they're getting at. Um, Ludru did write a letter uh, to the Emperor stating eight policies that he thinks should be implemented to run the country better. And a few of those policies were directly uh, kind of attacking the Emperor for his misdeeds. I think including the eighth one, which is called San, San Li, I believe was what he wrote, which means Emperor, you should stop hoarding wealth and spread it uh, because the country is in need and other stuff like that. Uh, so obviously that didn't go too well, but um, Emperor Liu Hong in particular actually really um, trusted Lu Zhi, and it was under this current emperor that Lu Zhi um, saw the most kind of promotions within the government because Lu Zhi early on was kind of a pure scholar. He didn't want to work for the government. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that soon. But our first mission is to beat uh, the rebel in front of us or just engage in battle with them. And once we finish this, we will get our first book, which is Dong Guan Han Ji. Uh, we'll talk about this book in particular for this episode since we are going to get it. And also, it's a great book to start our conversation. Um, and we'll explain why. So back to that point of our start historically. So we uh, are born in an area uh, in the northeast, a small town. Uh, same hometown as uh, Liu Bei, actually. Uh, that's why the teacher relationship. And Lu Zhi's family, uh, I think his father was already a government official. So it was a pretty well-educated family. He got to receive a good education. He had two teachers. Um, I think one of them was from the Ma clan, um, the famous one from the West, Ma Yuan's um, descendants. And they had a bunch of um, very talented scholars, and he had multiple really talented classmates uh, that were part of his uh, kind of education. And actually, speaking of that Ma clan, we have one of their kids um, in our faction, uh, Mami Di. So he is the Chancellor Remonstrant. Uh, this is just a localization thing. I don't think this directly translates into anything, um, but he's the, he's just a government official. Um, him. Uh, us and let's see if we have those Han characters. Tai Yong, Yang Biao, Zheng Xuan. Okay, so Tai Yong and Zheng Xuan are both classmates of Lu Zhi, of us. Uh, Yang Biao was, uh, will eventually become Grand Commandant. I don't think he's Grand Commandant yet. Uh, but these three, us, and uh, Mami Di, we were in the government as kind of uh, like a clerk position, but we were mainly in charge of being the court uh, historians almost. I and mean, it's not like just that's your only job, but that was also part of their job. They worked at a place uh, in the capital of Luoyang, which we can talk about soon with the mountain changes, but this is now the new change. You have this huge mountain range that's connected, protecting the south. The lumberyard is no longer part of the capital. The only way in is through Hulao Pass, and it's blocked here, so you can't take the water route. And not only is it blocked there, uh, the water here, this entire waterway, it's impassable, which means you cannot even land troops from this side. So if I'm over here, I cannot disembark and, and land. I can only get through the pass over here and over here. So super well protected. Uh, which means as long as we're alive, uh, we should not lose the Mandate War because it's going to be super hard for the Yellow Turbans to take the capital, um, assuming they put up a good fight. Uh, but anyways, uh, the city of Luoyang here um, has two major palace complex uh, because it wasn't always the capital of the Han Dynasty. Uh, we're currently in what's called the Eastern Han Dynasty. Um, there was a period called the Western Han Dynasty, which was the start of the original Han Dynasty uh, by Liu Bang. But in the middle, there was this um, regent who took over and formed what's called the New Dynasty or the Xin Dynasty. And they lasted for about 13 years. And then it was restored uh, by Han Wudi. And uh, it basically started or resumed the Han Dynasty rule. But the second period is called the Eastern Han Dynasty. And the reason why... Uh, they went with the western and eastern split is because of the capital choice. Uh, the western Han Dynasty's capital was in Chang'an, uh, or what's called the western capital, uh, Xijing, Chang'an. And then when they restored it, they moved the capital to Luoyang, which is called Dongjing, or uh, the eastern capital. 
And if you speak Chinese, you'd be like, Dongjing is Tokyo uh, or Kyoto. Um, Dongjing? No, it's Tokyo. Yeah, uh, and that's because it's an eastern capital. It's the same exact character. Uh, but in this reference, you know, west, east, um, it's more central nowadays. And, you know, the modern day capital of Beijing, uh, it's called uh, northern capital. Uh, Jing is the capital term. So Bei is north, Dong is east, and Xi is west, and so forth. Uh, but um, basically in this area, uh, while it wasn't the capital for the first half of the uh, Han Dynasty, even during the Qin Dynasty, uh, the one that was before the Han Dynasty, uh, where the capital was closer to Chang'an also, uh, they had a concept of eastern capital, and they built a palace complex there, uh, which was, I guess, later on in this period, it's called the Southern Palace Concept, uh, the Southern Palace. So it was kind of the old structure, and when they officially moved the capital to Luoyang, they built uh, the northern one. Uh, and they that's where they mainly live but the the southern one was still kept and within that palace complex there was this building called Dongguan uh, Dongguan uh, which is the name of the book that we're about to get Dongguan Hanji right so Dongguan is a name of a structure or like you can think of as a hall or like a big building within the palace and this building during this period was used as sort of uh, a great library Right. That's why this is saying great library here. If you're playing this on Chinese localization or Chinese language, it will say Dongguan actually instead of great library. But you know, if you just write Dongguan here, the Western audience doesn't know what that means. So basically it's a great library. It's where the government kept all the books, kept all the correspondences between you know government officials, letters to the emperor, decrees the emperor is given. There's copy of that kept. Think of it similar to uh, I guess the Library of Congress in the US today, where you keep the collection of books. And during this period, most of the books, um, the important ones, uh, you know, the old copies that you get, like, you know, think of books not as mass production uh, during this period. You know, you still have handwritten books and you have um, bamboo scrolls. And those kept really, really well. Uh, you had bamboo scrolls that are on earth today from this period and even before where the words are still there and the each slit of bamboo where it's written and then kind of weed together it's kept really really well and for those kind of you know early editions of the books it's kind of a treasure you can think of uh, medieval europe where the monastery kept holy texts because there's not you know a bazillion copies of these texts there's only a very few copy and sometimes there's errors and you have to uh, preserve these record make copies or uh, use different versions of the text to figure out what's the correct version because maybe this person copied a part wrong or a part of this text was lost or destroyed during storage or travel throughout history and then you found a different version and you kind of kind of piecing them together and rewriting them. So that was kind of the job here uh, in Dongguan. And Lu Zhi was an official who worked here along with those others that I talked about. And uh, Cai Yong is another very important one from that. And Zheng Xuan also. Zheng Xuan also had many very famous students, uh, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but overall, uh, their job was there, uh, working in this building, taking care of all the government uh, documents and all these books by famous scholars from before, including many texts by Confucius, many texts by uh, members of the Taoist uh, philosophy, I wouldn't call it a religion, and they're basically all kept there. And not only were they kept there, we mentioned how they were kind of court historians. Um, you basically wrote down what was going on at the time, keeping a record of things. It's a running record. It was started by a man named uh, Ban Gu, uh, who lived around the time of the second Eastern Han Dynasty, and he started the idea of writing the history of the Eastern Han Dynasty, because uh, the most famous history text uh, at this time period, it's, it's in here, I'll find it, there we go, the records of the grand uh, historians, and this translates to Shi Ji in Chinese, and Shi Ji is often, um, well not often, it is known as the, the start of the historical records movement in uh, Chinese history. It records everything that starts from uh, Huangdi. Uh, so basically from today, it'd be like 5,000 years ago. Uh, and it records the history from that period up till the start of the Han Dynasty. 
right? Because th this was written, you know, be before the Han Dynasty, uh, or during the Western Han Dynasty. So it was recording everything before the Han Dynasty, and then there was nothing, you know, recording the Han Dynasty. So they then they wrote a book called Han Shu, or the Book of Han, and that records everything in the history of the Western Han Dynasty. So by the time it was the Eastern Han Dynasty, uh, Ban Gu decided that you know we need a history book of our own. So he started the idea of writing what's called Han Ji or records of Han. Uh, Han, you know, right there in the third character, and then Ji means record. So it's recording the history of Han Dynasty. And during this period, at the time, it was just known as Han Ji, right? Dong Guan is the location. Uh, that kind of adjective to describe this version of Han Ji was added on. I think around the North South Dynasty, probably about 400 years later. And the reason why they added this is because this book started to get lost, um, uh, get destroyed. You know, it's a very turbulent period at the end of the Eastern Han Dynasty. And the person who started to cause destruction to this book is actually Dong Zhuo. Because you have to remember, Dong Zhuo eventually burned down the capital, uh, including uh, this great library here. And I think before he destroyed it, it was said that this historical recording of the Han Dynasty had 143 scrolls. Uh, each scroll has multiple chapters, so basically that many books of history recorded. And then they moved, They well, some people say they didn't all get destroyed, they tried to move some. And I think by the time of the Three Kingdoms, there was only about 122 scrolls left. And then eventually during the Tang and Song Dynasty, I think it was down to about 40 scrolls, right? So during that like 800 year period, most of the official uh, writing of this Hanzi got lost, which is why, or which is what prompted uh, the Song scholars during the Song dynasty to create a book called Hou Han Shu, the book of late Han, which is the historic text that I use, or most people use today, to study the periods of the Eastern Han dynasty leading up to the Three Kingdoms. So today, when we talk about the history of this part, at least the official history text, it's Shi Zi as the first book. And then after Shi Zi, it's Han Shu describing the Western Han. And then this book is not mentioned. Instead, it's Hou Han Shu, or the Book of the Late Han, and the next one, San Guo Zhi, or the Records of the Three Kingdom. That's the order of the history books that you would read. Now, the problem here with this book is it's not completely lost. There's about 22 chapters, or 22 uh, scrolls of it that was saved during the Qing Dynasty when um, they were creating like Si Bu Quan Shu, which is this giant encyclopedia project that was trying to keep all the ancient texts, and they were able to recover about 22 scrolls of this book. So it's still there today. There is a printable version, or there's a book version now for um, the remaining scrolls, and it has a few chapters. Um, uh, well, actually, that's another concept. The history book style that Chinese use is usually in a very personal style. So they have chapters on individuals, uh, as well as you know chronological, but it's mainly stories of individuals being pieced together, and you have the grand history of the time period. Uh, it's called uh, Zi Zhuan style. Uh, Zi is stories of emperors, Zhuan is stories of invisible uh, individuals, and in the 22 scrolls that's left, there is actually a surviving chapter on Huang Fu Song. Uh, so his chapter made it, and talks about his uh, life. So there, there's still. Some of that book still left, but not much, unfortunately. Uh, but the reason why we are given the role in the game to be the guardian of the Great Library here collecting these books is because that's sort of his job uh, during this period. Uh, obviously, at this time, during the Ultimate Rebellion, we were sent up north to fight. Uh, but you know, early on, before Emperor Liu Hong was emperor, uh, the previous emperor, um, we didn't really want to work for the government. We were kind of just in the northeast teaching. And the first job that finally convinced us to work is we were given a job called Bo Shi, which would translate to professor nowadays if you translate directly. But Bo Shi's job during this period was just to look after books, uh, kind of a, a clerk job. And that interested him. And he entered the government that way and climbed his way up until he eventually made his way to the imperial court and, um, you know, and got this book job. But then during this period, uh, when the Yellow Turban Rebellions were forming, the Emperor uh, Liu Hong, uh, the, the new emperor, slightly younger emperor, uh, decided that, you know, he trusted us. So he actually handed Lu Zhi control of the five northern colonel armies. 
So the item that was introduced in Fates Divided, uh, the follower item that gives you access to the Northern Army. Uh, technically, the concept of Northern Army is just means that's the army stationed north of the capital, defending the north side. That was handed over to Lu Zhi to go defend or to go defeat um, the Yellow Turbans. And the other general they gave him was uh, Zong Yuan, uh, Zong Yuan, uh, the auxiliary leader. So that's actually uh, that's a fitting uh, background. So the reason why he's the auxiliary leader is his role before joining this army was he was the lieutenant of the Wu Huan tribes. He was the Han, uh, kind of the government garrison leader in the Wuhan tribes in this area. So he was kind of in command of um, a nomadic tribal relations. And then he was sent as the second in command uh, for Luger's army to go north. Now, obviously, Luger's army would not be this small. He would have, you know, basically this stack. Well, technically, He Jin got the southern army to kind of protect the gates around the capital. And then we got the northern half uh, to march north to fight. And we had a great time. Uh, we, you know, were winning. Uh, we beat back the rebels. We had them um, under a siege, not in Lu Jun yet, but in a city between Lu Jun and uh, Ye, somewhere over here. Uh, but because we were sieging them for about six months, um, which was a long time, because we had maybe 30,000 men max, and the rebels that were holed up in the city had about 150,000. So it was not like we could force uh, you know, assault on the on the city, so we had to starve them out. Uh, but then the emperor sent uh, a eunuch who was um, just here as a supervisor inspector, and he wanted a bribe. We didn't want to give him a bribe, so we got sacked. And then once we got sacked, Dong Zhuo took over the army, tried the assault, failed, tried the different assault, failed, and then Huang Fusong took over after that, and then won the war really quickly. Uh, Huang Fusong technically shouldn't be with us at this point. Uh, he didn't come with us in the first wave. He was in charge of the Yan province rebels in the beginning. So technically we should be just us and Zong Yuan. Uh, he should be in the capital mining the books. Oh, Gao Yu. Uh, right. Uh, Gao Yu is just one of our students. He would definitely not be here. Uh, he's just a scholar. He's not even that important. I don't know why the game made him. Hmm. I mean, I think he goes on to work under the Kingdom of Wei, but just as, like, you know, a clerk. No military action whatsoever. But I guess he's in the game. Extra experience for characters. His bonus is really good, actually. Upkeep discount for Shot Cavalry. Uh, but I think he only spawns in the 182 start. So if you're looking to do some free upkeep cavalry campaigns, uh, Zhong Yuan is very important for that. 5% income from commerce, not so good. And then we have Fu Xi. Okay, so Fu Xi here should also not be here, but he has a great story. Oh, and perceptive. Oh, but very far away from patience. So capture rate, you could get 35% with him, but he needs to be high level. Level 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which is great for getting the unique cavalry as well, but I don't know if he wants to use those. Uh, but regardless, um, Fu Xi, Destroyer of Rebels. Plus three morale when attacking. Uh, bonus not so good, but a fitting, uh, powerful statement. He should also not be here at this point um, because uh, he wasn't sent up until Huang Fu Song was sent up. So he and Huang Fu Song was kind of a pair that were sent up to finish off the old term rebels after Dong Zhuo's failures. But his great stand uh, is actually after this, when the Leung Rebellion was happening later on. So right after the old turban ended, about 183. Um, yeah, it wasn't a very long rebellion. Uh, late 183, the Leon Rebellion happened uh, out west. And at that time, at court, uh, one of the Grand Excellencies, uh, Tui Liet, made an argument that it's too costly uh, to fight a war in the west and we should abandon the Leon province. And that was kind of his uh, call in the court. He was recommending that to the emperor. And at this time, Fuxi was not that highly ranked he was one i don't i don't even think he was one of the ministers but he came out during court and said we should execute uh Tui Liet for his statement 
and the Emperor asked him why. Oh, he's also one of those guys the Emperor actually quite, kind of liked. Uh, Lu Zhi and Fu Xi were both quite liked by the Emperor, uh, both extremely hated by the eunuchs, because both of them were very against the eunuch. You can see Lu Zhi's letter to the Emperor. He also wrote a similar letter describing to the Emperor why the Yellow Turban Rebellion happened, and obviously it was not very kind uh, to the eunuchs, and the eunuchs did not like him very much for that. But the Emperor still, I mean, I think Liu Hong wasn't stupid, but Liu Hong realized like a lot of things that these officials want to fix, it's not so easily fixed. And giving them more power and the eunuch less power doesn't make the emperor, in a, you know, doesn't put the emperor in a better situation sometimes. So that that's another politics statement. But um, but he came out and made that stand. And later on, he was sent out west to become one of the administrator to kind of take care of the rebellion. And he was working with the inspector, I think Geng Chu was his name. I'm not sure if that's exactly right, but I think his uh, surname is definitely Geng. And he told him, you can't march out. The morale's really bad. And if you march out with your men, you guys are gonna fail. And the inspector obviously didn't listen to him. And the inspector was kind of corrupt to begin with. And the troops, um, he was siphoning wages from the troop and the troops rebelled. And among that troop rebellion, was people like Ma Teng, uh, Han Sui, and Wang Guo, the future leaders of the Liang Rebellion. They basically, you know, caused a coup and uh, overthrew Geng Qiu's men, caused that entire army to basically turn to the rebels and um, join them and killed Geng Qiu, which left Fu Xi alone uh, in the commandery with very, very few men. And they were put under siege right away. And at that time, uh, Fu Xi was quite famous as a very uprighteous uh, man. He's also from the West. Um, his family, oh yeah, his family is also pretty pretty great. So he had an ancestor way back uh, in the Western Han Dynasty. Um, I'm, we're thinking maybe 200 years ago, who was sent as ambassador out west, far west, you know, trying to open up the Silk Road. Uh, and his ancestor was pretty much a badass in that he. Um, helped one of the local kingdom switch um, emperors uh, to someone who was more favorable. He basically caused the death of the local king and then supported the heir who was a hostage in the Han Dynasty to take over uh, to have more pro-Han um, policies. And then in another kingdom where like the Xiongnu also sent their delegation. You can think of all these small kingdoms in between on the Silk Road. Uh, pretty much a small kingdom squeezed between the Han Empire and the Xiongnu tribes, as in which side they should join. And then when they were debating, he went to the Xiongnu delegation and ended up killing the whole delegation. And then, you know, obviously the kingdom's like, okay, the might of the Han will go with the Han. Um, yeah, so they were out west for a long time. So he's well known in the region. And after, you know, his uh, you know his advice wasn't taken by the general and they got the whole army killed, uh, he stuck in the city with very few men. They were under siege. The Xiongnu um, group, the delegation, actually sent about a thousand riders and came out to negotiate with him, telling him that, you know, we know you're a good guy. You're not one of these corrupt officials. Because the Lao Rebellion is really uh, uprising by uh, the minority tribes in the area who had enough of these very corrupt inspectors and administrator being sent out here who was just taking money and land. And they you know, were not really trying to be opposing the Han rule or anything like that. And then because Fusi was well known to be righteous and, you know, not corrupt, they offered him a safe passage. Like, surrender the city. Uh, we'll deliver you and your family back to, um, you know, safety of the Han territories. And then Fusi being uh, kind of stubborn and incorruptible in that sense refused. Uh, even though I think his 13-year-old son kind of begged him to just be reasonable. I mean, there's plenty. He's, the argument is like, there's plenty of notable historical figures even at this time that have died for their country for for not basically sacrificed for no reason and you shouldn't die here uh, but he didn't listen um he didn't take the deal he took whatever men he had and marched out and fought and died uh, his kids were spared uh, those delegation honored his kids and sent them back and his kids eventually all all worked in the government and by government we mean the the way government because that's technically the official government. So all these people who are working in the Han court transition into the Wei court. So that's his family. Um, and we pretty much talked about everyone. He has a little side story with Yuan Shu, but not a pretty one. Like eventually under Guo Si and, and uh, Li Jue's government, 
it was sent out as an official to pass on different titles to uh, Yuan Shu during that period, and that was the period when Yuan Shu wanted to become emperor. So Yuan Shu held him hostage, took all the you know titles and uh, seals that he had on him, and kind of forced him to pass decrees for him. So while Cao Cao was holding the emperor in the future to issue decrees, Yuan Shu was holding on to uh, Ma Mi Di to hold on to decrees, and he got super frustrated because he can't do anything. You know, as a government official, he got basically kidnapped, and then. Uh, Yuan Shu was signing all these papers with his name and using his scroll and he got super depressed and ended up dying uh, of like basically sickness while under captivity uh, under Yuan Shu. And his body was returned to the capital and they wanted to hold a state funeral for him but then Kong Rong came out and said no. And the reason is, as a official of the Han, he disgraced his job because he got captured, lost all his seals and was passing out decrees, being used as a pawn, basically. And Koron's argument is he should die like a man, basically. Uh, which is interesting for Koron to say, because he lost his commandery multiple times where he just fled. Uh, but that's another statement. All right, back to the game. I think that's enough setup lore for all our characters. And we talked about one book. Now we got to talk about how to win this campaign, because it's actually super hard. Uh, obviously, this starting fight is piece of cake. We are fighting level two general without the level 2 skill, um, some redeem outlaws. Nothing too hard here, but obviously this army is one that we have to concern ourselves about, right? We got Tyrant Slayers, we got Gallant People, just a huge stack, and we had to figure out how to beat them with our economy. So the first thing I think we will do is set up some trade deals while our army looks strong. And the good news is so many options. So we are poor. We're going to look for what can yield us the most cash, and it looks like Tao Tian might be it. We have two trade routes, so I can also take a peek at his items. Oh, we got some bad items to start. Oh, well. Hmm. We'll probably just take cash at this point. Okay, not so generous. Closer. Alright, that's one deal. 334 Liu Biao. Okay, we'll take that deal. 7.0. Hmm. I guess cash is just what we desperate. Oh, these are all not very generous. I mean, everyone's paying a bunch of. Um, tribute to the Emperor, as we're all subjects, and we're getting a little piece of that back. Technically, oh, technically if they're all richer than me, I should be getting more back than I'm paying, but I'm not sure if that's actually the case right now. We'll take a look at our finances, uh, 204. Okay, that's not bad. We'll try to get more trade routes, I think that's going to be our goal. That's going to be our only source of income, just command rebuilding is going to be really, really hard. Ooh. Okay, we can load up on turn one with these deals. All right, because it's default non-aggression with the entire um, with the entire um, sub fellow subjects, I guess. He's poor, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, how much for the spear? We don't need a herdsman. What if I pay you? Hmm. What can I pay him? Cash? Maybe. All for a spear? Just that he's so poor that I can't get much from him. He only has 20? Oh my god, Sandal Maker. Okay. I okay, High Empire. That, that's gotta be worth something. 
Yeah, fund me. I'm fighting the war for you guys. See, Ben John is technically a rebel. He's a Leon rebel in the future. So I don't know why the game classify him as a Han, but that's fine. As long as he's willing to pay us. 31 maybe? 30. Well, that's really low. Three hundred. Ah, it's better to ask for cash. And just a few more deals. We need, we need to get our economy up, and also take a look at items. It's actually on the one eighty-two start. It's the you know, the easiest one to get a bunch of items on turn one because everyone you have vision of, you can talk deals in case they spawn a good item that you want. You can always try to get it. Okay, it's slightly better to get the cash deal. One point is kind of low, not really worth asking. 5.1, tall tall. Are you generous? That's no, not bad. 300 maybe? Okay, we'll take a look at this one. I actually kind of want these. For Huang Fu Song to use. I wonder if I can get it for... Uh, I don't think I can get it for a reasonable price, so... Maybe not. At least he's pretty wealthy. Okay, so our economy is much better right off the bat. And we're gonna get this fighting... Yeah, we had a pretty bad draw of weapons or items. I think we'll give him... Oh, he has the bow. I might steal this. I might give it to Hong Fu Song. Uh, give, give it to Lu Zhi. It just kind of makes more sense on me. And instead, we'll give you something to boost our morale and also boost your satisfaction. I think I'm going to try to keep everyone. Instead of firing them. Although we could. They're, they're not all... They're not that great. Oh, and we also have to deal with Fervor. Right. So I think on Man of Heaven, the best way to deal with Fervor is Administrative Office, actually. Because you actually get base Peasantry Income and Reduction of Fervor. We can build it to level 3 without any reforms, that's minus 9. Uh, the Public Order is going to take a hit, but that's fine. It's just basically going to give us income. It's better than this building, to be honest. Oh, well, maybe we should actually get rid of this building. Do I want to upgrade it? Do I have money to upgrade it? No. Yeah, let me actually set this up like this. We also need a commander, which also can reduce fervor with the assignment. These all take too long. Five turns. I could rush this. Just basically get 420 instead of 840. Or we can wait a turn. How long does it take to build this? One turn. Okay, maybe we'll wait a turn. It's fine. We'll kick this off. Close victory. Let's just go. Alrighty. It's a snowy day. So I think for most of these units, uh, we might actually end up disbanding them. It's a little bit too pricey. And plus, I want range units. And, you know, usually we never disband these, but because we can recruit these, you know, as many times as we want, because they're our own unit, we're going to probably disband them. Okay, so we're trying to get his level go up. He's only level 1. Uh, we need to get Hail of Arrows, which requires him to be at, like, level 2, 3, 4, 5, 5. So it'll take a while. What ability does he have? 
inner fire. That's an annoying one. We, di we didn't have, you know, a better weapon to give him, so I'm not too confident how this will go. But uh, <laughs> let's hope we're okay with this. I'll activate that. I guess I'll try to get the experience entirely on him. As in, I don't even want to touch the troops. We'll let him chase them all down. I would probably get used this twice in this fight, maybe even three times. Yeah, we're not sure we'll win this or not. We'll be definitely spamming this. It's 20 seconds and then 60 second cooldown, so 25% of the time we'll have this activated. We just needed a weapon, which is why I was thinking about trading for those dual axes. I wouldn't say it's going well. It's not going terribly. <laughs> Just gonna be a close call. He has a passive ability, he doesn't have an active one, so the stifling deluge is not doing us anything. We're just gonna have to spam this on cooldown. And barely win this. We will slow it down when it's closer. We used it, what, four times already? <laughs> He's at 4.8, I'm at 7.7. Oh, cool. I started with more health in the beginning, that's good. That's good. I think it's gonna go for another 60. <laughs> Yeah, he has 40 attack rate, I have 30, most of my damage is armor piercing, he has higher damage, his, be his weapon's better, I should have switched weapons, I have better armor, he has decent evasion as well, come on just stay still for 30 seconds and you can do this. We made it to another 60 seconds. He only he lost he lost less than half his health, so it might go another 60 seconds. We technically lost more health than he did. That's not good. Uh, we're losing. We're tied in health now. Yeah, well, AI also gets hidden stat buffs on Legendary. Oh, do we have to retreat out of this? Maybe if we can just last another 20 seconds, slow down the health loss. Oh, that's incredibly close. Come on. Stall, 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 stall. Okay, okay. 20 seconds, make them all miss 80%. Come on. No! It's okay. You get the experience, I guess.
Can we hit him a couple times? the bow. Hello. There we go. Alright. Yes, we'll get all the experience. I'm gonna use the rest of my ammo. kill like 16 of them. We do so little damage. We have 26 charge on the horse. Yeah, that's that's a problem. I think a lot of the strategists have way too low charge. It's as though they're not mounted. I think I reported this for a few of the generals. Maybe not Lutru. We'll add that to the to the list here. Just let me have all the experience. We just need to route one. And I'm pretty sure they will shatter. The boat only shoots forward. Just realized that. I turn around. Disengage. Fire the rest of your ammo. Okay, we got we got him. Wait, he didn't route? Come on. Yellow turbo morale is a little bit too high. Not done yet. Chase for those kills. Where's the other one? Wait, the other one already routed? When did that happen? Come on. There we go. Alrighty. That was a little rough. It didn't go as planned. But we got our book. We get 2,000 added to our treasury. Great. Share his knowledge with his people. Equip the book. Increase recruitment replenishment. Okay. Um, I might hold off on that until I build my first army. Because right now what we're going to do is actually disband this entire group. Did he get any experience from that? Oh, uh, he got some. Not a lot. Alright, the recall heal for everyone. Um, yeah, if we had switched to... Wait. Wait, when do we get this?
Oh, after the fight. Okay, we got it after the fight. I was like, if we had that before, that wouldn't have been a problem. Yeah, if we had this, it would have been a problem. He would have been able to win the duels. We are... I want an extra building slot. So if I get an extra building slot, I could probably just keep that. But it's five turns. Hmm... It's debatable what we want to do here. We get rid of this. We could do. I think I'll still demolish. I'll keep the cash. We're gonna build an army out first. In terms of assignments, we get what forty commerce, a hundred industry. We can't boost either one. Minus three mustering turns for a new army buildup. That's gonna be useful. Let's do that. And it's gonna be Lu Zhi, Huang Fu Song, and maybe Fu Xi. Oh, do we also want to adopt someone because we don't have an heir? No, not him. Uh, so when we went with the upkeep to cavalry might be the best option we have. Yeah, we could adopt him. We could also look for marriages, daughters, daughters, who has daughters? Um, who has daughters that's off age? No one? Lu, uh, Lu, Lu. Uh, we can't even see her, but uh, look out, not interested. Lu Kong's family, so Lu Xun's clan. No one has a daughter. Nobody obviously doesn't have one. He doesn't have a wife either. Okay, so that route's not good. Um, adoption? It's only for the 15% cavalry upkeep. But then we're not going to recruit any cavalry for a while. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we're going to summon these three next turn. I could fire him. Like the bonus is not great. He's just one of our students. Historically, he shouldn't even be here. So, administrator. I percent all sources. Fine. Keep him for administrator duty. Let's see. It's winter, so we get a reform next turn. That's good. I'm saving the upgrades to build stuff over this. I think we're good to go. I could even summon him this turn, I guess. And then get rid of the troops, that way he doesn't lose as much satisfaction. Yeah, we're not gonna put the book in. We're not gonna put this book in. Is is it that particular book or yes, that particular book? We can equip the other book. We got Huangdi Nei Jing. Uh, this we'll talk about this later. Um, this is a medical book, which is why it's a replenishment. There we go. I think that's all we really need to do this turn. Let's continue. Oh, Chen Gui dies. Chen Deng takes over. Whoa! Really now?
Okay. We're getting help. We're definitely getting help. We'll also gain another book. Having income exceeding 3,000. And we get more income. The Writings on Reckoning is a math book. Um, it's called Suan Shu Shu. Suan, Suan, yeah, I think it's called Suan Shu Shu. Which is why commerce is getting boosted. Uh, this makes our recruitment a little bit awkward. Like, we would... I guess we would want to run these. They're not particularly strong, but they're not weak either. They got good range damage. Decent frontline help. Like, I just feel like then Fusi can just take a break. I was also going to fire... I mean, we were thinking about firing him. Hmm... Yeah, I think we take this group. He doesn't get along with us, which is fine. I think I come out personally, and... Alright, we're definitely building that. I was hoping to get the flexibility to boost the replenishment for a little bit. Like these troops, and then we'll get 10 more percent. The mustering is helping, and then like, once we put this book on, we get 10% more. Well, we already get this, we get another 10% once we reach Noble. We love Lord. He's only level 1. Ooh, resourcefulness. That's a good one. Alright, I think I still want Huang Fu Song out here. He should lead then. Two turns. Make sure he doesn't die. Um, who gets... Who gets siege weapons? Hmm. Do I want the administrator now or do I want another trade route now? I think I'll take trade. Three twenty one plus T. Yeah, Bangre will be the inspector of the Jin province at this point. His death is going to open up Liu Bell to take over. Sun Jian's going to kill him. Anything else? Alright, he already used all his items, I'm sure. Yeah, we're going to try to use trade to supplement our income. Now, because he's also faction leader, should I adopt him? Like bonus to peasantry, plus another. Oh, his trade. Oh, his tree's weird, right? He gets a trade route here. Huh, that's not bad. I have two thousand. I think. He's gonna so he's gonna drop twenty points. So I think I make him general off the left. We recruit. Full retinue on him first. And then I'm gonna 
do frontline duty later because I'm level three. I mean, this, this will be the army right now, right here. Yeah, it's a weird situation. It's not an easy start. Hmm. Yeah, we're never going to use him, so I think we fire him. And also this student. Because I think if we get Administrator, Wang Fu Song's probably going to take over just because of the high expertise. I guess we could keep him. Alright, we'll save some money. Recruit a front line. We just basically gotta beat back this army first and then deal with it afterward. So that's fine, let's continue. And the Drum Brothers. I mean, technically the rebellion hasn't started yet, so. I mean, we're already at war with them, but it's still the setup phase. My question is should we launch the attack against them offensively? Maybe next turn? I think we do one more round of uh, recruitment and then we flip the units back to um, or defend, or protector of uh, the general of the right with a discount. It's so weird to recruit these on him, but he's the only level 3 general we have and we definitely want some unbreakable front lines. I can afford three. I kind of want four. I can offer one food and ask for some cash. Mm, do we have anything we don't need? Not a lot. Hoping for more. Oh my god, don't be so stingy. Two point five. That's good. Okay, that's as much as we can do. Now we want to decrease upkeep. That will save us the most money. And that's going to be the first army we'll take out until they rank up a little bit more. And he's leading just because we get the extra 10% firing rate here. Alright, let's continue. I'm just very happy he's not charging at us. Nanjing? Uh, well, I mean, we're going to take the bonus while we can. There's also set bonuses when we get uh, four books of like the same type, I guess is what they're considering here. Um, so these would be like mostly historical books. The, the category, like the way they categorize it is a little bit off in my opinion, but um, we'll, we'll take whatever we have. And once we have more, we'll try to get those set bonuses. There's five sets. I think each of them have like a bonus related to one of the five elements. Alright, nothing useful there. We're just poor right now, so we can't upgrade anything. Although I think we probably want to upgrade that when we get a chance, because Fervor's just going up neighboring county, neighboring force. We have to beat them back. Um, we are interested in eventually getting a commander to help us fix the Fervor. But I'm not sure if these two are the ones we're looking for. Plus, they could be spies on top of that. 
So we're gonna pass. We're gonna just wait for the replenishment to kick, like to fully finish on these one more turn. Then we'll actually just attack them. I think. So, or actually, should we attack them this turn before the garrison fully replenishes? They just upgraded it. So, oh no, it's yeah, it's not that high. The replenishment is not that high. I mean, we probably wipe out Zhongliang with one battle, right? Hmm. Let's go win it. He's back from residency, so there's not much uh, problem if we lose it. Let's go. So obviously we're not favored here. Um, it should just be open field. Yeah, because this is a very low level farmland. They are taking attrition right away, but they will probably just bounce out and fight us, uh, which I don't want. I want to fight them. They have two cavalry units. Three. Four. Uh, three. Okay. Archer gang. We're okay. Let's fight this. Let's get one brother down. Alrighty, so we need distance because our advantage is basically the flaming shots. We want to pound them as much as we can before they actually get to us. The house here is actually kind of a good place to make them kind of walk around and guide them along the way. So maybe we want to center around that. And let's see what else we have. So we got ourselves some Dongzhu Bing. And spread it out a little bit. There's no way they can uh, get a cavalry unit through that slit. I don't know which unit is going to take care of uh, Zhang Liang, but uh, we'll try. It's going to be a close fight. Fight to the death. Who can you duel? What's 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 your ability here? Oh, immobilize. All right, let's go take care of him. I, I trust him. He, he with a better weapon with this he should win these duels he can probably even kill the other one too we'll start with the easier one here actually I'll guide him Fire. Okay, maybe it's wasted on the cavalry. Should just focus on. Infantry. Yeah, he's winning. We gotta take care of the cavalry well. Not let any accidents happen to our troops. I need him to deal with the other general for me. The cavalry is kind of shifting. Ah, 
看我取你首级！我不知道谁打的，其实。There's some units there. What are you guys doing? <laughs> Fire off your last shot. Or last two shot. There's still a couple of cavalry over here, so I'm kinda of scared of that, but we'll try to do what we can. Shoot him with that bow of yours. It's pretty much just our unbreakable front line trying to hold against all the old turbans. Try to use. Oh, turn around. Shoot him. It's not that hard. Alright. Alright. 向前进军 Oh, he lost his horse already? You're not very good at this, are you? Alright, go help kill that. I think that's unbreakable. No, that's not unbreakable. It's just high morale. Time to throw them into combat too. Try to close out more flanking angles. Shoot them. They done? Okay, they're done. You come over here. Actually, no, over here. What are you guys doing? Huh? 
Yes. Okay, this side's finally routed. Pin them down. Oh, he lost his mount too. Forward on. Fight. Be brave. Alright, take care of him. Yes! Faction wiped! One brother down. Alright, definitely a brutal battle. But with that... Zhang Liang is gone, and we're going to do a little bit of adjustment here before we end the episode and end the turn. So he did level up, wonderful. And he also leveled up, which gives us a potential trade route if we make him heir. I'm going to recall him. He would give us 5% extra replenishment, so that would help us out here. Unfortunately, we don't get much income from that place, just another farmland. Um, we're not at war with the other two John brothers because the rebellion hasn't started it. Um, it's kind of weird, but that's that's the way it is. Uh, we also have some spare money to actually build this up. We need to take out fervor pretty much everywhere. We're going to need that if we want to fix the fervor here. So that's going to be our next target. Uh, once I think Rebellion starts probably next turn. Uh, we'll see right away. I think this army is good enough to just keep fighting. Uh, these need probably two turns to, oh, well, three turns maybe to even bounce back to fighting shape. But that's good. Let's uh, continue here. Ah, no, it's just a graffiti yet. It's not even the Rebellion mo mo hasn't Wait, actually rebelled yet. Uh, Fervor is uh, something that would just spawn rebels in the future. Uh, we're going to be able to deal with it soon, but if they have rebels, we'll just fight them. But I think this is a good place to end our episode. Uh, we beat one of the three brothers already on episode one. It's quite a long episode, though, uh, because we spent a lot of time just introducing the faction, introducing the characters. Uh, pretty happy with where we are. Uh, quite surprising to get help from the Dongzhou units. Uh, Dongzhou technically are just refugees from these provinces here. They're east of Yi province, but they're not technically east of where we are. But it's kind of fitting that they're fighting for us on the eastern front. So that's that. Uh, we'll pick things back up and wait for them to actually rebel, crush them as well. Um, we'll probably play a few turns after the rebellion for sure. Uh, it's not going to be like a super short uh, speed run campaign or anything like that. Uh, but we're not in a rush to you know play out the entirety of Three Kingdoms. But overall, pretty good so far. We don't have an heir. I'm still probably debating how do we deal with that. Like. Promoting him as an heir is not terrible, like 15% peasantry is not bad, an extra trade route here is not bad, that would definitely help our economy, um, also make some family, so there's really not a satisfaction hit, but two strategists leading, probably not the best idea, but we don't have any commander options. We could also just find him a wife, uh, randomly, and hope that it's a commander, but um, there obviously a chance component to that. So we'll see what we do uh, moving forward. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this and see you all next time. Bye.